Opening a lifetime of love is something that most people don't get the opportunity to do. We think the Lord in heaven has not prepared us a partner. We think that our prayers and our dreams are not possible. We're told that we're not good looking enough. We're told we're not wealthy enough. We're told that practically we don't have enough income to entice someone into our life. When a man lives in poverty, he is really challenged with the fact that there is a clause in a marriage proposal, in literally what we say in wedding vows, that is until death do us part, but also for richer, for poorer. When a man knows that his fortune is only the girl he loves, he might be poor. But as his life starts to rise, as the Lord starts to protect his life, as the opportunities in life start to subside, he really is looking at for poorer instead of for richer. When we talk like this, we have to look at how we're going to handle life. When a person's technology is removed from their opportunities, it means that they cannot make phone calls. It means literally that they cannot produce emails. It means they cannot get responses through LinkedIn or Twitter. It means that technology companies lie to those across the land about what services they provide for free. Because have you ever received anything from any of those technology companies like Facebook that tell you precisely how many people see your posting, or better yet, how many of your conversations actually get through to the real person you're trying to talk to? Or perhaps do people lie to technology companies to have others who they just don't want to see their postings removed? They can lie and say, this person's stalking me. They can lie and say, this person's harassing me. They can lie and do all sorts of practically unwilling things, literally, to produce a life. But when I say unwilling things, it really means that they might have had a relationship with someone, but then they decided to break that relationship in some way or some form. They literally decided that I'm no longer going to tolerate this person in my life because I don't like how I'm feeling around them. But instead of doing the Lord's choosing, which is to say, Lord, am I supposed to stay in a relationship with this person? Am I supposed to find peace with them? Am I supposed to produce a conversation that makes professional sense or personal sense or personal satisfaction guaranteed, if you will? How do we produce a life if our technology fails us? People might be trying to mend fences through technology, but if the technology doesn't work, how in the world are they supposed to respond to people's invitations to marriage or parties or liaisons or anything else? You see, when technology is pilfered from a person, it is illegal. It is also immoral for a technology company to use social engineering to pretend to be other people to give the illusion that a person is literally getting through to the person, the individual they're trying to reach professionally or personally or intimately. I want us to think for a moment about what life would be like if we went back to landlines. If we went back to landlines that are literally still in most of the old building structures, we might actually know whether or not a telephone call was actually made or not. We might actually have a little record on an old-fashioned answering machine. We might actually still have the privacy of our telephone because a landline is not as easy to be hacked. It's not as easily to be transferred to somewhere else, and it's not as easy for a perpetrator of crime to pretend to be us by simply changing the phone number on their telephone to the be the outgoing caller. In my life, I've only had a few telephones. I don't remember all the telephone numbers. I don't remember the telephone number I had back when I was a manufacturing uh, oriented uh, coordinator of sorts. I don't remember because it was a company line that I was allowed to utilize however I liked. And I'm sure they figured out who I was calling, but I was too dumb and naive and young at the time to realize that I was calling people on a company line that they could see who I was calling. That they realized I had a liaison and a friendship with someone in the plant who was not in my department, but was a good friend who helped keep me awake when I stayed late at the plant. They never said any problem about that or me calling my family or anything else. I never really used the phone for anything really business-wise, but I guess they probably it to me, or maybe I had one on my own. I don't really remember. I honestly can't remember that far back. 
that is the challenge of memory these days, is that we don't always remember what we've said or what we've done or how we've interacted with someone to produce a loving relationship. I know in my lifetime there's only been one or two women who've literally asked me what my future plans were. Usually when a woman asks, where would you like to be in five years, you sort of are taken back because it sort of implies that she might like to be along for the ride or she's checking to see if you want to be along for the ride in her life. I've only literally had that happen one time in my life, but I have to say that individual impacted my life in ways beyond compare to any other human being I've ever met in my entire lifetime as an adult. And practically, I've never been the same since losing that relationship. Now, when I talk about this proudly, when I talk about this vainly, when I talk about this in a gossip-oriented way, how does that make you feel as a listener? Probably nothing. Or you might be going, you know, I've got some people like that in my own life. I have a personal friend that I'd really like to talk to I haven't seen in a long time. And maybe I'll just reach out and touch someone like we used to say with the old telephone commercials. And I can't remember who did that. Maybe it was Bell back when, when there was still that company in the world. Then I think became AT&T. But who the hell remembers all the conglomerates taking over others and changing names, etc. I know in my own bank, I started with National City. I literally had the same teller for 20 plus years. I always went to the same woman because I trusted her implicitly with my money. The reason I trusted her implicitly with my money was because she always treated every single transaction, regardless of whether it was small or large, with the utmost dignity, professionalism, and quietude in her voice. She never pronounced what I was doing. She never made it too loud in the bank where there was other people around, and she just treated me well. There was only one time where we had words in the entire 20 plus years of relationship, and I just wasn't having a good week. I'd been hacked a lot. I'd been pissed on a lot. And I just wasn't feeling right in that moment to give her my money. And I just decided to come back another day when I was feeling better. We still occasionally have seen each other out in the community. She's always professional. I've gone back to her on occasion when I've been produced with a check that goes to that bank, which is now, I believe, PNC. But that's not the point, that customer service is won and lost in moments of time. But when there's a long-term relationship like that, you make allowances. She always asked about my parents. She always asked about my family. She always seemed to sort of literally remember or she would fake it well enough. But she was a loving soul of Christ's blessing in my life and that of my Japanese family's lives. They always treated my Japanese spouse with dignity and respect, even though we did not hold the same last name. And that was a caring thing that she always did. She always greeted us both. She always cared for us both. And that is what a professional does in the banking industry. They remember the simplest of things that in banking, their number one focus is to make sure the individual feels they can trust the banker, the personal banker, the teller with their money and their financial information. The young people in the banking industry today don't quite get that. They're quick to dial in someone's name. They're quick to dial in someone's phone number. They're quick to even remember someone's social security number. And that's a scary little thing. But openly, I recently visited a bank where there was a girl who was kind of smarting off to me, and I just decided to ignore her because I wasn't yet a customer. But I produced within her an interest in me when I told her some of my story. Some of my life had been cyber hacked, and some of my things had been filfered. And therefore, I didn't have a house in which to have things sent to. So she was kind enough to allow me to use the bank address to handle a transaction that I desperately needed to do. And that was such a great kindness that the bank would do that. It literally made me more interested in her as a banker personally, but also in the bank itself. And what I really liked the most about that personal bank is that they actually use a photograph to verify the person in front of them. I've been asking that question for years in banking and everyone always says, no, we don't do that. And I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I realize I don't have the same hair on my head. I have more hair on my chin, but I'm still the same person in my eyes, my nose, my mouth, my ears, and everything else that would be visible in a photograph. And a scrutinizing teller would know the difference. They would literally see you on a regular basis. They would know that you were changing your hairstyle, etc. Now, where am I going with this talk? It's a great question. You see, in life, we have moments of time to produce interesting information for people that when we're trying to create an interesting little program, we have to talk about things that matter to people. And in most people's lives, money matters. Employment matters. Research about their physical health matters. Liabilities also should matter, and people need to get that very clearly in life, that when people violate a person's rights, 
they create liabilities for not only themselves legally, but also for their companies they represent. They sometimes think they can get away with those little snide remarks and those little pig-headed comments that they make after someone leaves. I've literally listened to retail employees talk about other customers that came through a drive through and I've been flabbergasted that they've not realized that they've just insulted someone who's helping to pay for their salary. But it's an immaturity. It's a youthfulness. It's a 20-something that usually does something like that. The more mature ret retail people who have been in retail a long time know that it comes with the territory that not everyone sees the soul of that retail employee, that not everyone gets how important it is for them to handle their food, but openly we still have to be producing respectful talk with a lot of people. Now in my life, I might talk a lot about a lot of different things, but when I'm talking about a person's money and finances, it's really a modest situation. You can't always know where someone is headed in life. You can't always understand where they've been, and you certainly don't have any rights to pilfer their financial statements, their bank accounts, their tax information, or anything else protected by federal law from any type of seizures underneath the Fourth Amendment. And literally, we have to pay attention to those constitutional rights because if we don't pay attention to our rights in those ways, then other people's rights might get taken from them, but more importantly, our rights could be taken from us at any moment in time, especially if our rights matter not to people who are in positions of power. You see, the local government doesn't out-trump the federal government, and the federal government doesn't out-trump international laws. We have to really start to look at the lineage of American history, that when we came here as settlers to America, we wanted certain things in life. We wanted freedom of religion. We wanted freedom from the pilfering of our property by government officials who had no lawful right to seize our things. We wanted other aspects of freedom of sexuality and immorality and morality and everything else that goes in between the aspects of living life, liberty, and freedom in a way that each one of us so chooses. When I joke about some of these things of sexuality, it's literally because we know the three topics that one is impolite to speak about with total strangers is usually politics, sex, and money. But in truth, we have to talk to some strangers about our money in order to produce more. We have to be willing to sell ourselves in a way that makes sense to others, and we openly have to be willing to help people who are in need of help. My father was a great one for helping total strangers. I don't know how he did it with his little aspect of millions that he had, but he didn't really have millions. He just was thoughtful in his investments. He made good choices, he made wise, sound decisions, and as a result, he and my mother lived quite well in their retirement years. I can't say the same for my siblings or myself. We've all had our challenges in life, we've all had children who were difficult, perhaps, but in truth, when we make a life worth living and retirement worth having, we're not always focused on the future. We're usually living only in the day-to-day. And the day-to-day -day life produces our relationships, it produces our social settings, it produces our liaisons in love and other business affairs, but most importantly, it produces our retirement eventually. And I talk about this regularly because people need to think about it more. I'm not a financial planner, I have no concept of that stuff. I've met some lovely people in that industry, young and old, and finding someone to truly trust to talk about my worries financially has been a bit of a challenge. I have met one gal that I really liked that I would have probably trusted with my information, but there was just something on the edge of unreasonableness with her abilities. And that's okay. I have another person that I trust pretty implicitly with my finances in the reality that if I die, she gets it all. She gets all my property. She gets my life insurance policy, which is not a huge sum, but it takes care of my passing and gives her and her children something to remember me by. How do you feel about your life insurance? Is it enough? Will it cover your passing? Will it cover your demise? Will it cover anything you plan to do with your body after it's moving your soul into spirit? And it's not my business to ask, but perhaps you need to look at that if you haven't already. Maybe I'm just naive. Maybe everybody in the world has already plan that out in their 40s and in their 50s about what they should be doing with that. I can't say. But in life, we only have moments of time to make a difference in people's lives. So if I gently nudge you and you haven't done anything with that, 
or if you haven't named your benefactors or you haven't even put a policy in place, then maybe it's time to do so. I realize I may not be the only child of my father who kept the life insurance policy that he put forth in their stead. My dad put something in my place when I was zero years old. The minute I became an adult, I took over all the payments. As a result, it's almost comical the amount of time I've talked to the people who handle that life insurance policy, considering how cheap it is for me. But openly, I'm so grateful to my father for putting that in place. I can never thank him enough because it allows me to tell the one that I love, that I love her in my passing, regardless of whether she loves me back, regardless of how she feels about the fact that I've chosen her to be my legal heir. You see, I was planning to give it to my original spouse and my son, but she's made it a little bit difficult to stay in contact overseas. Her current husband is producing her life now, and that makes me somewhat no longer responsible for another man's child who I parented. He has his own birth father, and now he has another stepfather. So I guess that puts me on the outs of that. I'm sad about that fact, but I had to make a decision. Was I going to live in the past, or am I going to produce myself for the future? Now, when I share this information, I haven't told you who she is. It's not your rightful reason to know, but I'm trying to say, hey, who are you looking at in your passing? How are you going to handle that? What's going to happen if you get ill and can't work anymore? Have you prepared yourself a marketing plan for your life if you have to start working from home? Do you have a network marketing company which you're getting mailbox money from? And if not, there's several people in my LinkedIn channel I'd like you to talk to who really know what they're doing there. I can't promise all the products or things that I'm crazy about, but they know what the heck they're doing. They're worth talking to because they've produced a life several times over in that industry. And I mean large life to the point that they don't go to a job. They just run their businesses. That's really a respectable thing. It means they know how to create relationships, but what it also means is they know how to create long-term relationships with people who stay viable customers and they're always out going out looking for more. That's really quite a thing because it's a tiring industry to always be looking for people who are interested in purchasing a product. In the sales of services, we have people who sign us up and then they never do another thing for us. That's what happens in insurance, but they don't make billions of dollars off us. They just make a little bit, and if they have enough policies, they make enough to live on. When we're talking about insurance in life, we have to look at how we protect our lives, how we protect our loved ones, how we protect the ones that we truly want to honor and cherish in our passing. I'm pretty sure that there's not one person in my sibling set who has put me as a legal heir to them I don't even believe my mother has me in her will anymore because of my siblings' interactions with her life. But that's okay because I have my own life insurance policy and if I'm late in life, uh, meaning if I grow old alone, I grow all alone. But it is my hope that it'll produce a love in someone at some point. And if that happens, I don't think I'll change the policy because that person will probably have their own children, their own issues and their own challenges. And openly, I'm not sure where God is going with this message, but in reality, we have to look at who loves us till the end. And I know in my soul that the person I've chosen, for whatever crazy, insane reason the Lord wants me to, I love that person until the end. And that's it. When we talk like this, we have to pretend nothing. When we talk authentically with people, we're telling them the honest truth. When we talk transparently, transparently about real life in any position, any industry of any kind, we have to really look at how much we're making right now to provide ourselves a life, but how much are we setting aside for our old age or how much do those companies, corporations, or organizations put aside for us to live on? I posted an interesting article recently in my LinkedIn channel about what it takes to live in retirement. $500,000 was the minimum, and that covered anywhere between 8 and 12 years depending on the state that you lived in. I found that pretty fascinating because I'm a far cry from that kind of money in the bank. And openly, it makes me realize I may end up working into my late 60s or 70s, or I may just lose my life from police harassment and all the other crap I've endured from people policing my life, feeling they had the right to take away my rights and literally stealing me blind out of my storage unit. But when I talk about it, where are the investigators? Where are the top up skills of people who are supposed to stop the illegal aspects of that? 
The illegal people here violate laws all the time because they were either never instructed in our laws or they don't care enough about America to care about the rights of other people in comparison to themselves. And I think that's a sadness in the land. Now, when we put this together as an audio cast, we simply start talking freeform. We hope the person who's going to listen to this one will get the message. We hope the person who listens to the next one will get that message. And openly, God plans who's going to listen to something, doesn't he? He literally puts an interest in a title in someone and they start to listen. And they either hang with it or they don't. If you've been in my listening audience a while, you know I've been through a lot. You know I've been through a lot of challenges. You know I'm looking for a job in podcasting and audio casting because I like the format of radio. It's not that I'm not handsome enough for television. It's just I'm a bald furry guy who's not going to change his look for any TV program. Unless, of course, Oprah calls. And then maybe we'll think about it because she's pretty fashionable and absolutely a stunning, beautiful woman at her age in life. Now, when I say that, I'm not hitting on her, so I don't want to be beaten up by her husband. But I'm just saying that there are some women who know how to put it together. And there's a lot of ladies who really need that help. Now, I've made my little cut and joke paste. I'm going to pull out of this audio cast. I'm going to start again on something else. And I openly hope that the people listening will understand that when a man loves someone, he puts it aside for that person and that person alone. And that is loving thing that he does in life. And when a woman has to do that, she can do that too. That is the land of freedom that we live in. Thanks for listening. This is Blake Kinson of Blaze Communications LLC saying, take care of the people you love, even if they don't love you back. Thanks for listening.